Uh oh. There we go. All right, well, hello everybody and welcome to our Missouri Prairie Foundation webinar, Shorebirds of the Prairies with Doug Palmer. Um, my name is Brooke Widmar, I work for the foundation and I wanna thank all of you for joining us today on this gorgeous Wednesday, at least it's gorgeous in mid-Missouri where I am. Uh, during the presentation, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section on your screen. Um, and at the end, I'll come back on and read those to Doug when he's done with his presentation. This webinar is being recorded, so if you have, um, uh, and the link will be shared with all of you tomorrow, along with resources mentioned during the presentation um, in the, the Q&A section. So to introduce today's speaker, Doug Helmers retired from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as the Iowa Private Land State Coordinator in 2018. Uh, prior to working with the for, uh, not for, so Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, he was a wetland emphasis team leader with the Natural Resources Conservation Service in Missouri. And in addition, he spent three years working with the Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network in Massachusetts. After a career of habitat improvement work, he's still doing the good work, including uh, restoring and managing prairie and woodlands on his own property. And now he's a valued MPF board member. So without further ado, take it away, Doug. Well, thanks a lot, Brooke. Um, yeah, uh, this is gonna be really fun. I, uh, it's been a while since I've talked about shorebirds, hope it all goes well. Uh, but, uh, but really, you know, when we're talking about shorebirds, I wanna kind of start out is that, you know, with, with shorebirds and prairies and wetlands is really kind of all a wetland continuum. And so, so we're gonna kind of start out a little bit probably on the more wetter end and then move up to the drier end, but it really, you know, I mean, we can functionally draw a line between where the wetland is and where the prairie is uh, from a, standpoint of a legal standpoint but really they're uh, they're, they're really a functionally uh, big transition uh, area and uh, and really uh, go across boundaries throughout the year so uh, so anyway let's start talking about shorebirds here a little bit and usually when you know people think about shorebirds the first thing they think about are the little wind up sanderlings that are running up and down the beaches when the Florida when they're down there on vacation and that's sort of some of the first indications of people kind of thinking about shorebirds and uh, that's probably some of the first things I'd thought about when when I first really kind of started thinking about them but uh, but really shorebirds are an incredibly diverse group of birds uh, we have here in North America we've got 50 plus species uh, that are you know from very dry to almost completely pelagic uh, we have, you know, here in Missouri, we probably have around 31, 32 species that, that will regularly come through here uh, during migration. And, and, I'm gonna, and I would say that there's probably about 20 that would be fairly common uh, that we would see uh, throughout the, during the year. Uh, the one thing about shorebirds is, is some of them are incredibly long distance migrants. So there's really kind of two groups. There's sort of a, a shorter distance migrant group of shorebirds and then there's a, a, a long distance group. And many of these species are Arctic breeders. And so they'll spend their, uh, the very short summers uh, in the Arctic and then migrate back through uh, either the central United States or along the coast to wintering grounds in South America. Some of which are going as far south as the very tip of South America all the way down to Tierra del Fuego. So, so something like a Hudsonian godwit or a white rump sandpiper that's wintering in Tierra del Fuego and breeding in the Arctic is making about a 25,000 mile passage during the year. And that little white rump sandpiper is probably only, yeah, it's about two ounces. It's gonna be making that pass, you know, 12,000 miles up and 12,000 miles back. So they're, they're really incredible birds if you think about them from the standpoint of, of what they're trying to to interact with and, and even on the sort of the shorter end of some of the things uh, you see it there on the uh, on the left the bay of fundy which is a really big migration spot for things like uh semi-palmated sandpipers in the fall and they're taking about a 50-hour flight out over across the atlantic and landing on the coast of suriname 
And during that time period, they're losing about half their body weight. So there's, there's some, just some really neat things about shorebirds that are, uh, that are out there that, uh, you know, with, like I said, a, a great diversity within them. What I'd like to do now is just talk a little bit about shorebird conservation and kind of where we're at with that uh, in the big picture. Uh, back in the 70s at a place called Manlet Bird Observatory, they started a program called the International Shorebird Surveys. And what that program was to do was to try to get volunteers, and it was all volunteer based, to go out and look for shorebirds in various places across the, across the country. They were mainly working on the eastern part of the United States because another group in the West Coast at a Point Reyes Bird Observatory was sort of doing some of the stuff west of the Rocky Mountains. And so uh, the International Shorebird Survey was going for a number of years and we're starting to find areas where shorebirds were concentrating in fairly large numbers uh, in different places across the country. And at the same time, they were doing the same, this type of work in South America. So they were also trying to identify wintering areas and in areas, you know, down south and trying to, you know, figure out, you know, what birds were using what areas and, and, and various things through banding programs and such. So uh, with that going for several years, in uh, the mid 80s, uh, the Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network was established. And the point of the Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network, better known as WIZERN, which is a lot easier to say than the whole big long thing, was to uh, sort of identify these, these high priority areas where big, these big stopover areas, and then uh, place uh, some importance on them from a, a, either a hemispheric or international or regional, depending on how many shorebirds were there, and try to then start working with those areas, whether it be on uh, you know, federal ground or state ground or even private lands and try to start working with those landowners and land managers about, uh, you know, trying to conserve shorebirds and things we can do to, to help them. You know, a lot of stuff on the coastal areas has to do with, you know, with disturbance, uh, you know, from dogs and vehicles and all kinds of things that go on in, on coastal areas, but then also more in the interior areas on working on thinking about uh, management and, and, you know, preserving areas and preserving uh, big areas that are that are not protected. So, excuse me, I'm a little dry. Um, so anyway, in uh, about 1987 or 88, I can't remember, 87, I believe, the uh, North American Waterfowl Management Plan was written and set up a whole series of joint ventures for waterfowl. And just about that same time or a little bit after, there was a lot of discussion about not only having that plan incorporate waterfowl and looking at waterfowl populations, but it also started talking about non-game and trying to integrate non-game into the, the plan. So this was about the time I had just finished my master's degree at the University of Missouri and was working on, I had worked on shorebirds at Cheyenne Bottoms in Kansas. Very cool place if you ever get possibility to go there and uh, was hired by Manimut in, in Wizard to uh, start working with the joint ventures and in integrating uh, shorebird management into waterfowl management. So in doing so, we wrote the uh, shorebird management manual in 1992 and began a series of workshops that we were working with uh, both uh, public and private land, man well, pr public land managers waterfowl managers, basically, uh, wetland managers, and then also private uh, duck clubs in various areas to start talking to them about how we can integrate shorebirds into waterfowl management. And this program, uh, we just started doing a whole series of workshops. Uh, we wrote some regional plans, and, uh, and that is continuing to today um, throughout. Actually, just this January, was the second edition of the shorebird management, which just came out, you know, 29 years later after the first one. So, uh, so this work's still going on, and uh, and it's a, it's a, it's really neat. I'm I'm really proud to say that I was kind of in on the ground floor of some of that work. So that gives you a little bit of background, sort of on the bigger picture of, of where we are with shorebird conservation. 
Uh, so let's just talk about a little bit of uh, ecology on shorebirds. And so I'm going to put in the context of not only just shorebirds, but a little bit of water birds also into it. Because like I said, we've got this whole continuum really within the prairies and wetland systems and having different vegetations and water depths and, and substrates and, and various things that all go into it. So when we're thinking about, uh, you know, shorebirds and other water birds and what we're going to think about from, and you can think about this from just going out and observing or thinking about doing management type scenarios and some of the things you need to think about. So water depth is incredibly important. Well, for one thing, that's what's what probably one of the biggest ones uh, to be involved with. Uh, but the soil water interface is important. The vegetative structure, that being both the height and the density of vegetation, food availability for those for our critters, and then also the season of timing. So if we start out looking at just thinking about water depths, a whole range of, of water depths for different water bird species. You know, you can see some of the you know, some of the larger species, the herons and cranes, are going to be using you know, pretty deep water, where if we look at the whole group of shorebirds, most of them are using water less than eight inches deep. And that's on the very deep end um, for some of our largest waders uh, that are shorebirds. And, but the majority of those species are using water, you know, less than two inches deep. And uh, so that's a, a very important factor to be thinking about. You know, if you, in, in thinking about two inches of water, it's, it's sometimes it's hard for people to kind of grasp a little bit, but if you just have your boots and you step into water and the water goes over your toe, you've already excluded 40% of your shorebirds. That's the kind of shallow water depths we're talking about for, for this group of species. So not only within, uh, you know, the whole water bird guild, they have a range of foraging depths, but then also we have within the shorebirds themselves quite a range of water depths where some of the things like uh, you know, some of the plovers uh, are going to be using, uh, you know, uplands all the way down into some very shallow water. Uh, the small sandpipers are, are feeding all the way up onto dry mud flats, you know, the right at the, the soil water interface and then into water about, you know, an inch or so deep. So then we go all the way out to things like, you know, abacets and stilts, which, you, you know, they're, they're a taller shorebird, so they can use a little bit deeper water. Sort of as an example here, this is a a uh, winter shot of a uh, short-billed dowitcher, and and that bird's probably standing at about two inches of water. So that's probably about you know it could probably it, they a lot of times they'll feed up to about their belly in, uh, in some of the, in the water depths. Now we start thinking about vegetative aspects, um, and, and we look at water birds in, in general also again. You know, there's a big range of what types of tolerances, uh, vegetative cover, uh, both vegetative height and, and density uh, will be used within those groups. If we look at something like the, the bitterns and the rails, um, who are going to be species that are going to be using very densely vegetated, tall cover uh, within a wetland complex or even, you know, some of the edge areas, well, then compare that down to the shorebirds where Shorebirds virtually don't want any type of vegetative cover. I mean, they want a very short or almost none. Um, and the spart and the vegetation cover then is going to be very sparse to none. So we're talking, you know, usually about 25% cover. And uh, except for a species or two, which we'll get into later. But but really, we're talking about species that are, that are really wanting open habitats such as this. So this group of semi-palmated sandpipers is, is probably at about an inch and a half of water. And you, so you can see that there's just very sporadic vegetation and it's, it's fairly short. We talked about soil water interface. This is the kind of, you know, situation that, that are just ideal for shorebirds where you have these very, very flat landscapes with, with the shallow water. Uh, sparse vegetation. So there's a very, you can see that, you know, this from the water to the, the sheen up to the, the drier area. And that's a big range of area of habitat that those uh, birds are able to use. 
a lot of times these shorebirds will be in big mixed flocks. And so you'll have uh, shorebirds out into the water, some right at the edge of the water, and then some all the way up into the dry ground. Foods then, um, a lot of our other water bird species, some of them have quite a diversity of foods that they'll use. Uh, if we just take dabbling ducks, for instance, uh, they'll, they will eat seeds and tubers and, and green brows, which is just young growing vegetation and invertebrates where the shorebirds then are just almost strictly eating invertebrates, uh, whether it be aquatic or terrestrial invertebrates, they're, uh, that is going to be their main food source. Now they will take some seeds once in a while, but they take quite a range of, like I said, aquatic and terrestrial invertebrates. Um, up there on the upper left-hand corner are, are called coronamids, and that's probably one of the main food sources that shorebirds use, especially here in the interior. But we even said that, that shorebirds are very opportunistic. So whatever the big food source is, at whatever wetland they're in at the time, or or prairie that they're on, whatever, whether that be grasshoppers or beetles or, you know, spiders, you know, those that are up on the drier end, they're going to be using that, whatever's there uh, for them because they're able to get the, the nutrition they need for them from invertebrates. So if we look at shorebirds, how, how, how they forage. Like I said, we've got a big diversity of, of species here. You know, we've got, like I say, about 50 different species here in, in North America. And so they're going to have a range of, of habitat types. Uh, they're going to go from all the way from open water and basically really even open pelagic uh, water to aquatic systems to terrestrial systems. And then they have different modes of foraging. And the main two are really the, the probers and the gleaners of the, of the way shorebirds make a living. Uh, there's a couple others, the, the sweepers and the priors, but the main, the main ones are gonna be probers or gleaners. So probers are gonna be shorebirds that are going to basically feed down in the mud. So they're gonna be taking their bill and pushing it down in the mud to forage for uh, submerged aquatic invertebrates now that are down in the substrate. And a lot of the species that do that have very sensitive and uh, bill tips that they're able to uh, able to figure out the difference between, say, a coronamid and a root, just based on their, the sensitivity of their, their tip, because they're not really able to see what they're foraging for. Now, the gleaners, they're going to be a group of shorebirds that are really sight feeders. And so they're going to be walking around and uh, poking at things and we'll be poking at things in the water column or off the ground or right at the edge of the, the slow water interface or, but they're really a more sight feeder. Now the sweepers are things like avocets and they use their bill and they have little lamellae in their bill, sort of like a duck. And they're just taking their bill and sweeping it back and forth within the water column to grab small invertebrates. And then the priors are sort of the tough guys of the shorebird world. And that's gonna be avocets and turnstones and they have a bill that's sort of chisel-like, and then what it'll, they'll do is they'll take that bill to open up mussels and clams and, and very hard, hard-bodied invertebrates. So, in timing, then um, is also an important factor in thinking about sort of when things are going to be around. And shorebirds are, the, are an interesting group because, from a migration standpoint, they're sort of the last ones to show up and the first ones to leave and come back through. So because we have so many, uh, most of our shorebirds are coming through Missouri, you know, the vast majority of them are, are migrants. They're just, there's going to be a short window when we're going to see them in the spring and a short window when we're going to see them in the fall, um, especially for any individual species. Um, and so uh, they're, you know, they're, they've got, they've got to get here, get north, get their thing done and get back south. So to get back down to South America. So, so they're, they're very quick at what they're trying to get done uh, is basically what I'm trying to say. We do have some breeding shorebirds here in Missouri and we'll talk about those just a little bit later. And so even within uh, the shorebird group that there'll be uh, shorebirds that'll come through at different times. And so if we take these three small sandpipers, the the white rump sandpiper, the buried sandpiper, and the semi-palmated sandpiper, they're all three shorebirds that are 
about similar size, uh, eating similar foods, but they're coming through at different times. So the Baird sandpiper migrates the earliest, followed in by the semi-pollinated sandpiper, followed in by the white rump sandpiper, but they're all going to the same places in the Arctic and they're almost getting there about the same time. So there's some, so there's some dynamics going on and in sort of the central part of the, the, the country that separates them. And maybe it's a little bit of niche separation, we're not really sure, but, but there are certainly timing differences in, within those species. And there's some other species that are similar like that. Dowagers and still sandpipers are similar in size and they migrate at quite different times. So we're getting ready to either maybe do some thinking about doing some management or maybe even just thinking about doing some bird watching. What, what kinds of things do we want to think about if we're going to go south somewhere to, to do, visit some of our prairies or our wetlands or whatever to possibly do some, do some birding. So our spring migration period here in Missouri is going to run from about mid-March, mid to late March through early June. That's going to be our spring migration. Uh, summer fall migration is going to run mid-July through about early October. And that's a little bit more of a, of a, a long or drawn out period. And, and I'll give you a couple of reasons why is, is for one, the spring is pretty tight, mainly because birds are trying to get to the Arctic and, and get, get, the, the, get their nesting done. Where in the, in the fall, it's a little bit more elongated because what we tend to see is the, the adults tend to come back through first. And so they'll be headed down South America fairly soon, but then a lot of the juveniles are kind of dilly-dallying around trying to figure out the way to make their way back down to South America because their parents left them. They have no idea where they're at. And so they're going to be taking a little bit slower time to, to try to get through and get on down South. Now we're going to look for places that's going to have shallow water. Um, like I said, our areas are going to be looking at at you know four to six inches up to drying mud flat all the way up to drier prairie. Uh, we're gonna be looking at, you know, the majority of those shorebirds are gonna be using areas that are like less than two inches. Uh, our vegetation and the areas we're gonna think about are gonna range from zero to 75% cover, but that 75% cover is really only for a couple species. And the majority of those are gonna be using about 25% cover. And then the height, you think about a height of vegetation on a bird. So we're looking at about a third, less than a third of the body height for, for certain species. That's kind of their vegetation tolerance. And so for a leaf sandpiper, that's like half an inch. Hard to get your grass to grow that short, but uh, in a dow etcher, it's about two inches. So, so based on their body size, dictates on what kind of tolerance they have for, for vegetation. So if we were to think about um, looking at, you know, some of our prairies here in Missouri in, in relation to some of the wetland components uh, and looking for areas that we might want to go try to do some spring birding on uh, for shorebirds, we would definitely want to look for some places that would hold some, at least some ephemeral water during the, during the spring. And a lot of our prairies here have, have really what we call ephemeral or temporary basins associated with them, where we're really only going to have water for a few weeks to maybe a month or so during the springtime. And those are the types of sites that uh, shorebirds are going to be looking for during their spring migration. And these sites that we've had that have either been made possibly mowed in the fall or winter or have been spring burned are probably going to be those areas that are going to be most conducive because if you sort of carry it, look at that picture and carry it to the background and to that all that tall rank vegetation, that's just gonna to be too rank and too tall and nothing, they're not gonna be able to see it. So because shorebirds are migrating, they're, you know, they're flying at a couple thousand feet, what they're looking down for to find a place to find, they're looking for kind of what we kind of consider sheen. So they're looking for that, that area where they can see, they can see the shallow water, they can kind of see that shallow mud. And that's the kind of conditions that they're looking for to be able to find an area to stop over on. And they find a place like this, they may stay for two weeks uh, to fill up, you know, if, if conditions, if conditions are right and the food and the foods are, are good for them. <clears throat> also within our prairies, we have, you know, sometimes with some of our prairie areas uh, may be associated with a prairie stream. 
And in, in some of our prairies, we will have maybe possibly old remnant oxbows. And those oxbows are probably a little bit too deep in the spring for shorebird use. But as, the, as we talk, start talking about the summer fall migration, then these areas then will be drawn down just naturally during the, during the summer. And so by, so by July, late July, early August, you know, first of September, they'll have mud flats that are associated with these edges. And so that's where we'll see a lot of our uh, fall migrant shorebirds showing up on some of these areas that, that because the, the vegetation will be low in the oxbow itself and they'll, uh, they'll find really prime areas. Also those prairie streams themselves uh, can provide some shorebird habitat for, for at least a few species that'll use some of those types of habitat. So let's go over a few species that uh, we might possibly be seeing here in uh, mid-Missouri or in Missouri and, and, and some of our prairie areas and some of the, you know, more, more common. I'm, I'm not gonna go through every species we have that, that, that come through Missouri, but I'm just gonna kind of give you some, some different guilds and, and a few common species that would, that would possibly occur. And this is a cool, really cool picture because you would hardly ever see a greater and a lesser yellow legs in the same place at the same time. Uh, but uh, to get it in a picture. But so anyway, the yellow legs are some of the sh larger shore birds. So they're going to be some of the deeper waders, you know, so they're going to be using that four to six inch water depth. Uh, they're gleaners, so they're sight feeders. Uh, a lot of times you'll see yellow legs that are just, they're basically almost running through the wetland chasing bugs. And uh, so they're, they're really just dictated by the, the differences are really just the size. Um, they nest in somewhat similar areas up in the, really in the boreal forest and don't quite go all the way up to the Arctic. But, uh, but those are some of our taller waders that, that will be coming through in, during migration. Now, there's a couple more here that are pretty common. Uh, the pectoral sandpiper is probably one of the most common shorebirds you'll see uh, out in some of our prairies around here. They can tolerate a little bit more vegetation. Uh, they're, they do both probing and gleaning as far as their, their foraging and looking for inter, invertebrates that can come in into fairly large flocks. Um, you know, it's not uncommon to see two, 300 pectoral sandpipers in a flock. And as opposed to that to the solitary sandpiper, which is called that for a reason, you'll only see one at a time and they'll be scattered out and uh, they're, they're, they're just not, they're just a very solitary bird. They're also a gleaning shorebird using shallow water habitats. They'll use some of the stream habitats, as I mentioned before. You'll see them along stream banks every once in a while. Now the common snipe, uh, it's a shorebird. Uh, it's also a, a migratory game bird, um, but it uses is wetland habitats, but it's gonna be that one that's using that very far end of the vegetation spectrum. So they're gonna be in taller, denser vegetation, still in very shallow water, as you can see with this one, uh, but uh, they'll use quite dense vegetation. You could be walking through, you know, knee high vegetation, you know, with shallow water in it and, and common snipe will just start popping up all over the place. So they're a little bit more secretive and uh, but use that uh, more vegetated type cover. Now on the smaller end, on the very shallowest end, uh, a couple of shorebirds, one being the semi-palmated sandpiper uh, up on the upper left-hand corner and the least sandpiper. And these are two fairly common shorebirds uh, that, that can be seen just about anywhere when you get good conditions and, and shorebirds are showing up, these two, two, two are gonna be around. Uh, the semi-palmated sandpiper is probably one of the uh, highest populations of any shorebird that we have in, the, in North America. And so it's a very common shorebird. Uh, the least is, is another one. It, the least sandpiper, I may have just said that, but it, it tolerates just a little bit more vegetation uh, than the semi-palmated. Semi-palms really don't want any kind of vegetation around them. They want big open mud flats. Now we're gonna start moving up into the drier end of the spectrum and more really kind of more true prairie uh, aspect. Uh, this species is called the lesser golden plover. And, uh, and it, during any time in the spring, you could see either one of these cutlers, uh, whether it be in completely in breeding plumage or still in winter plumage, and they'll be all in mixed flocks. But 
these birds are uh, very gregarious. They have they come in and usually in very large flocks. Um, and they'll what they're looking for when they're coming in, they're looking for very short grass prairie. I mean, stuff that's short, and that's what they're going to be hitting on. So a lot of times, these birds will be found on on golf courses and uh, airports, and you know, areas that grow uh, sod. You know, they'll we'll stop by in some of those for you know a few days. They may or not mind find food, but but if we get them out on our prairies that are associated with you know especially if they see some of these areas that are source, sort of associated with more wetlands, then we could get some pretty nice numbers of, of golden plovers during the, during the spring and fall migration. So another really cool species uh, is it has almost, uses almost similar habitat to the buff breast or to the lesser gold. And they're gonna be up on the drier end of the spectrum um, in short prairie. Uh, we don't really see a lot of, of buff rusteds usually during the spring migration, but we tend to see a little bit more in the fall. Uh, they're just major migration ground or path is just a little bit to the west of here um, during the spring. But uh, but they're a really cool bird. They uh, this is a little interesting tidbit on on buff breasted sandpipers is that is that once they're up in the breeding grounds, they uh, they form leks, and so just like prairie chickens do where the, all the males will get together and, and show off for the females, and then the females will then come and choose for the, uh, which one of the males that she wants to take. And so it's a, it's a really interesting uh, uh, breeding strategy that they, they have up there. And they flip their wings up and they dance around and do all kinds of cool stuff. Now, the pot, spotted sandpiper, it's another fairly solitary shorebird. Um, this is one that you would probably see along a lot of prairie streams uh, associated during migration. Uh, the spotted sandpiper does nest in Missouri. Uh, it's, does, it's not a real common nester, but it does occur in, as a nesting shorebird. American woodcock, then, uh, is another species that uh, occurs. It's more of a forested species, as you would expect with the name, uh, but but during the spring, and especially while during the breeding time, they will use uh, open, you know, especially burned areas. Uh, my wife and I here manage quite a bit of our, our little farm here, and we burn quite a bit, and have you know woodlands sort of surrounding some of our grasslands. And starting about late February, early March, it's time to go out and start listening to the woodcock sing, and they'll you know do their flight and their dance and. And uh, they're really, really enjoyable to see just about dusk. And so if you have prairies that are, you know, especially areas that have been burnt, that are, might be close to a, a prairie stream or, or a woodlot, uh, that would be a good place to try to find, uh, find woodcock. So then there's the, the kill deer, which is probably one of the most adaptable shorebirds that, that are out there. Um, as you all know, we see them in parking lots and they nest in gravel roads and everywhere else. And they're a, you know, they're a pretty much a bird that's on the drier end of the spectrum also. Uh, you know, we in, will nest in very, very short grass also. Uh, we had a brood that came off in an area that we were, had just put a pollinator planting in this spring and, and had a, a pair of Carol deer that nested and raised young uh, on some, you know, it was almost bare dirt. And, uh, and that's, you know, the type of habitat that kill deer is gonna be using. And then now there's really the iconic, you know, prairie shorebird, which is the upland sandpiper. And really this thing doesn't really have much to do with water at all. I mean, it's really a true prairie, prairie species. Um, you know, the, the upland sandpiper, the, the major nesting area is there in red. And uh, so it's the majority of the Great Plains up into central Canada. And then the wintering areas are way down in, uh, in northern Argentina and southern Brazil, in those grasslands that are known as the Pampas or, or Llanos uh, uh, prairies, and there's down, you know, lots of cattle grazing and such down there. And so those species are the, they are, they use those same habitats that, that are used up in, in the Great Plains. This is a, uh, just a uh, hot map from the Breeding Bird Survey to, to show the, 
the areas of highest density of, of upland sandpipers in the country. And as, as you notice there in the Great Plains, basically from Oklahoma up to southern Manitoba and Saskatchewan are sort of the main areas. But we do carry a few, fair number of uh, upland sandpipers here in Missouri, and, and you, you can see them, that's for sure. I guess those of you who have seen them, and, and this is sort of the iconic pose of the upland sandpiper when he's just about ready to take off on one of his, his uh, courtship flights, standing up on a on a, uh, a fence post somewhere. Uh, that's, you know, it's just really kind of the true iconic looking uh, pose of, a, of, a, of the upland sandpiper. You know, the upland sandpiper has the uh, the wolf whistle call, uh, kind of the whoo, whoo, and, uh, and it, it, you, when you hear them, you'll know the, what it is. So upland sandpiper, you know, do, like I say, do nest here. They don't really like super dense areas or looking really more of a, of a moderate uh, density for, uh, for putting their nests and, and, and breeding in. But, but what they need also is a lot of heterogeneity. Um, that, that means that they're looking for areas that, you know, for, for nesting itself, they want something a little denser, but when they're foraging, they want fairly short open areas where they're able to see and, and able to forage. And so, so they're going to need, you're going to need areas that are going to be fairly short, uh, you know, areas that, uh, that have been grazed or are being grazed in some of our prairies are, are used a lot by shorebirds or, or the upland sandpiper because it, it kind of gives it that heterogeneity as opposed to something just like a, a solid stand of, of, uh, of blue stem or something like that. Um, and not only do they nest in prairies, but they'll also nest in, uh, in tame pastures and in, in fescue and, and brome and those types of things if, it, if the structure's there. I mean, that's what they're really kind of looking for is, is structure. Uh, occasionally they'll nest in a bean field, don't ask me why, but we've certainly found them there uh, every once in a while. Um, and then the broods, once they get the broods up, and they're going to try to move those broods into those areas that are real heterogeneous so that to, to those young chicks can be able to get down in through the, through the uh, vegetation and, and be able to bug, bug around. Um, they are ground nesters, of course. Uh, they usually have a clutch of about four eggs um, that takes about, oh, 24 to 26 days for the, the uh, eggs to hatch and then the chicks will will fledge in about another 24 to 26 days so uh, that's sort of the, the general life cycle uh, the the adults both the male and female uh, tend the nest and then also tend the chicks for a little while uh, the, and then it usually ends up with the uh, the male tending the chicks and then the, the female is already bolted back to the headed back towards South America So I'm about to wrap up here, and I just want to talk about a couple, a few other real quick species that that for me are really cool because I I was around them a bit when I was in North Dakota, and uh, they're also they're all prairie breeders uh, and very prairie associated with uh, one being the willet. Uh, the willet breeds up in the northern Great Plains and then winters in the basically coastal areas of of southeast United States and, and Gulf of Mexico. Uh, not a long distance migrant, a fairly short distance migrant. And uh, it's a fairly gray bird, gray looking bird until it goes to flight. And then it has these incredible black and white striped wings that when you're, and, and they are noisy when they're doing their, their courtship flights. And so, uh, so you'll be up in the prairies and, and one of these things will start fluttering around and, and it's just quite a sight to see. Uh, the marble godwit's another one, which is the same way. It's a, it's got a little bit more orangish under its wings and uh, very loud, very, you know, boisterous when it's doing courtship flights. And, uh, and they nest in very, very short grass. I mean, the most tabletop overgrazed prairie you can find, that's where you're going to find marble godwits. And what's unique about them, well, I don't know how unique, but, but what's really cool about them is their nest looked like a pile of uh, buffalo dung. And so... You know, there's probably some ecological or uh, evolutionary thing going on with them in the short grass prairies where they were, uh, they basically would make their nests so, so predators would not find them because it would look like every other pile of poo out there. So uh, that, that's really cool, you know, a little tidbit about the 
the marble godwit. They they also the same way. They uh, they winter in the in the Gulf of Mexico and down into uh, Baja California is kind of about as far as they go. And so they don't really use that long bill uh, so much in the breeding grounds because they're most of the invertebrates are fairly shallow. But when they start using the coastal areas and they're able to get down and get some of those great big aquatic worms that are that are deep down in the soil. And the last one here is the, the piping plover. And I actually had the opportunity to work on piping plovers in North Dakota uh, during my undergraduate. And they are uh, up in the, uh, the east coast of the United States, the Great Lakes and the uh, uh, upper Midwest or upper Great Plains. And they're associated with either really big rivers up in the Great Plains and or where I was working on them were on alkali wetlands. And these are basically salt salt wetlands and they're salt plains. And so they have these very light bodies. And, and when I was working up there, you'd have these little cotton balls running around on this white background and they were about impossible to see. So, but it was, it was kind of neat to work up there and, and actually get to work on them. This species is endangered. Um, it's on the endangered species list. And uh, populations basically have been somewhat stable but slightly declining in the last number of years, but you know, it's hopeful that we can get them turned around also. So with that, I thank you all for your attention and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you, Doug. I love the uh, cotton ball description for, <laughs> um, for plovers and, and baby plovers. That's that's how I describe little killdeer when I see the babies running around. So uh, yep. very accurate, very accurate. Um, so. Uh, I did have a number of questions come in. Um, let's see, someone was asking, you did talk about habitat requirements. So someone's asking if they wanted to attract shorebirds to their property, um, how big of an area do you think they would they would need to, to work with? Great question. I've seen, I've seen shorebirds on some fairly small areas. I mean, I guess there, there's two parts of that. I guess if, you, if you're looking at trying to develop a small wetland, you, know, you could probably develop a small, say three to five acre wetland. Uh, if you did it right, did it shallow, uh, kept the vegetation down, that you would probably be able to attract a few shorebirds to that. Uh, the, the prairie would be a little different. Um, a lot of them, a lot of these birds that are hitting these prairies are really large open tracts of land. So it's, it's existing uh, grassland areas that, that are pretty large, I think, uh, to try to really, you know, especially like Upland Sandpiper who would be, uh, I think they're, you know, you're probably looking at a couple hundred acres minimum uh, to try to attack uh, Upland Sandpiper. But, um, but as far as the, the wading shorebirds, uh, you know, the Sandpipers and, 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 and such, uh, you know, you can you can track those on smaller smaller tracks because we have a lot on our, a lot of our small WRP tracks that we put out. So good to know. Thank you. Um, someone here was asking, what are some of the best sites in eastern Missouri to see these birds? Doug, do you have any ideas of some good sites for them to see shorebirds? Yes, I would say in eastern Missouri, probably go to any of the waterfowl areas. Um, public waterfowl areas. And so like uh, Ted Shanks would be a good one in north, Northeast Missouri. Uh, and then down in the boot hill going to either Mingo National Wildlife Refuge uh, or uh, Duck Creek uh, Conservation Area. Uh, let's see, 10 Mile Pond is down there from the far lower part of uh, there and then also the confluence area there in by St. Louis, north of St. Louis would probably be, I'm just kind of thinking out of my head, those would probably be the, the top three or four places to, to go to. That's perfect, thank you. And I see someone had put in the comments, they had mentioned seeing some shorebirds at Forest Park in the, in the St. Yeah. Louis area. Um, yeah. And then they, they also mentioned traveling to Cheyenne Bottoms and Quivira. Um, which Doug, you and I had talked about. Great, great area yeah. for, for sure. Yeah, if you go to Cheyenne Bottoms, go to Quivera also. You know, it's, it's a totally different habitat, so. Awesome. Um, someone here asked, do they do any breeding programs for the shorebirds? Um, 
in not i wonder if they mean like in missouri um yeah we, or we doug, doug do you know we definitely would not in, don't in missouri i don't believe um there has been some and i'm not going to say it's a breeding program because it's really kind of a recovery program that has gone on on the missouri river for piping plovers where uh if they know the river is going to come up they'll go snag the eggs and try to incubate them and raise the chicks but as far as any captive breeding program uh, I don't believe there is any going on that I know of. So. Okay, thank you. Um, someone here asked if you can speak to the coloration for spring versus small um, migration, or or even what are some good resources for folks that want to learn more about that? Okay. Um, oh, geez, I wish I had my shorebird book here. Um, what what uh, do you know? What book it is that? or your the one you were talking about earlier in the presentation well the oh the that would not have identification so a sid okay. is probably one of the better manuals um for just learning um you know i mean i learned i learned my short birds on with with robin it's, you know so um but there is a a, a really good book out there it's 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 Shorebird identification of the world, and I can't think of the name of it, but I will get it so we can have it on our resources list when we send out the email. How's that sound? That's perfect. That's perfect. We'll we'll link all these. I resources apologize. I have my my yeah. I just I can't pull it out of my head right at the moment. So it happens. It happens. Well, Prater thank you. And um, I think's the name of it, or uh, I think Prater and Mancher are the authors. I think it's just shorebird identification, but it's, it's shorebirds of the world. So okay. Well, we'll look it up and um. Yeah, we'll look it up. And everyone can keep an eye out for that email tomorrow, and we'll have the we'll have the name and a link to it. Yeah. See, um, I didn't really get into identification too much because because that's really a whole whole separate uh, thing because you got your brown browns and your gray browns and your you know your slightly yellow legs and your yellow legs and so. Identification is, it, it really is it to do it. It's just get a book, get out there in your spotting scope and, and, uh, and just try to learn them, so. Great, thank you. Um, here's, here's a question. Um, will the Western drought conditions heard about in the news recently affect migration uh, timing or patterns, do you think? Or have you seen that in the past? Yes, yes, it does. Yes and no. So it, it's going to affect the those populations out there that breed in the in the West. So the the black neck stilts, the avocets, the the western snowy plover, uh, some of those species that are that are more inland type breeders. Yes. Now, as far as migration occurs, then what it could do um, is it could delay some migration if they're not able to find resources along or have to show up on the breeding grounds in, in poorer condition. They're still going to make it most likely um, based on whatever resources they have or able to find. But if they don't have good resources, they may just show up in not great condition. And so that means that, that once they get to the Arctic, then they were going to have to spend more time building up those resources for, for egg production. So. So yes, the the drought absolutely could affect uh, both breeding and migrant birds. Thank you. Um, someone is asking what shorebirds follow more closely to rivers versus still water. Um, do you have some insight on that, just in case someone's closer to uh, some river areas than they are ponds or wetlands? Well, yes. Yeah, so. So the rivers, what they're going to be using on rivers is going to be, especially big rivers, is going to be more uh, sandbar type habitat. And so that's going to be more your, more your plovers and your things that are going to be using sort of for the edge. Uh, when we were surveying the Missouri River, we did get, you know, a fair number of, of small peeps, the, 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 uh, the small sandpipers are called peeps in the shorebird world for, um, but they would they would use the, that mud that water edge, uh, but you're probably not going to get a lot of the uh, the probing shorebirds uh, in in a lot of that sandy area along the river. So it's going to be more, ooh, yeah, sort of the more your generalists, I, I would say. So like uh, 
spectral sandpiper, semi palmated sandpiper, yellow legs, you know, sort of the, the general ones that I talked about as opposed to some that are, that are more specific uh, to, to more mudflat type habitats or shower or so. Great, thank you. Um, here's a question. They said, I assume all the shorebird species have precocial young. So getting up and running around right after hatch, is that correct for all these shorebird species? That is correct. They're all precocial, yes. Awesome. That's the little, the, the cotton balls with toothpick legs running around. Cotton balls um, and legs, that's exactly what they are. Um, there's a, uh, here in Columbia, we have the Bradford Farms and sometimes they'll have plastic out over part of their fields. And that's where we can see um, you know, most often kill deer running around, but uh, it, they're, they're not very camouflaged against that, that black tarp. So it's really easy to see them. Um, I do see a comment here somebody put in uh, after sure. we were talking about sites in the St. Louis area. They said there is a stopover site at the Audubon Center at the confluence. Um, yep. Oh, and this is the same person that was talking about Cheyenne Bottoms and Quivira. So, so they know some good shorebird sites and we're oh, yeah. sharing those with the crowd. There's a awesome. bunch of shorebirders in Missouri. So. Yes. Yes. Well, if there's any other questions, feel free to um, throw them here in the Q&A box. And I was, I was excited to see the, the golden plovers years ago when I had first gotten into birding. That was my my first trip to a Prairie, Founda Prairie Foundation Prairie was we went to Dade County and went out to Pennsylvania and Coyne and um, the Welch track out there uh, in search of uh, the golden plovers um, and other and other shorebirds. Lots of lots of fun uh, birds to find there in the spring on the prairies. Yeah, we found we had a whole big flock of them this fall at our our, our waterfowl lease up in the drier part of the the property and they stayed for no oh, I don't know a week and there was probably 40 or 50 of them running around so it was really neat that's awesome those are fun birds Up and the, the longest migration of any uh migrating birds so they made quite the trip to come here and visit us in Missouri they so do. we had to go and say hello great well I think um that's all the questions that were coming in there's lots of comments you know, great presentation, another high quality presentation, very informative. So lots of praise for you, uh, Doug, here in the in the comment box. So um, thank you again. It was a fantastic presentation. I learned a lot and I know all of our participants here did too. So we'll send resources tomorrow so you can keep, keep learning with uh, that book title and other um, resources. And again, a, a link to this presentation if you need to rewatch any parts of it. So thank you again, Doug. Um, this was a great thank presentation. You and yeah, awesome. Well, I hope you all enjoy your Wednesday and uh, we'll see you on another, another webinar here in a couple weeks. This summer, we're kind of doing them every other week. So we have a, a masterclass on um, edible, edible fruits uh, here at the end of the month. So hope to see you guys on that one. All right, well, thanks. Thanks, Brooke. Thanks, Doug. We'll talk to you later. Yep, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.